Hello everybody and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today I'm going to demo a watercolor painting. It is going to be on 11 by 15, a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, 140 pound cold press. I just um, saturated this paper with my large hake brush uh, so everything's nice and wet and I'm going to jump into the painting. As I was putting this together, I was like, you know what? I haven't done, you know, just a, par a painting in a while, or at least in a few days. I've been just doing a lot of experimenting and exploratory stuff. So I was going to jump into it and start painting. Then as I was wetting the paper, I started thinking about Chinese landscape paintings. And um, they're usually painted on silk or um, the the rice paper, and you know not so much on watercolor paper. And um, you know there's kind of a transition between the two. And then I was thinking, what about you know just kind of painting in my style, but trying to do a a Chinese landscape painting or a Japanese landscape painting. So that being said, um, this is going to be a completely experimental video. Uh, like once again, on, um, fortunately or unfortunately, because I was thinking, and this is a mixture of, um, ultramarine and burnt umber to get kind of a gray. My initial thought was, and sorry, I had lost my train of thought right there after I talked about the colors. It's Saturday morning. I'm still kind of waking up and whatnot. What was it going with? Okay. I'm kind of applying my style to the Chinese style. Um, yeah, I'll just forget that thought. We'll keep going. So the mixture of these two was kind of to replace, this is ultramarine and burnt umber once again, was to replace the um, the black ink that's used in the, the Chinese paintings. Which it'll have a different effect due to the granulation of um, ultramarine. And of course, we'll see some of that potential blues or browns coming through. Okay. Now from here, everything's wet and wet. I think I will be build up like kind of the mountain the Chinese landscape scene. One thing is the kind of a uh, ratio of size of the Chinese Japanese paintings is different than the ratio of the paper size that we usually see in Western watercolors. Whereas um, the Chinese is more elongated either horizontally or vertically. They're, um, you know, seems to be a common ratio that's followed for watercolor painting, whether it's, um, or even photographs. Within Western photographs, you'd see um, a three by five, four by six, five by seven, eight by 10, 11 by 14, 16 by 20. Um, you know, in canvases, it's just, that's the common pattern that um, seems to happen where the relationship in the, the Chinese painting, I'm not really sure offhand, but I'm just going to throw a guesstimate as opposed to 11 by 14. It might be, you know, in Western, maybe it's 11 by 18. You know, the one side is, um, way larger than the other. And why that aesthetic is and why that developed, I'm really, I, I have, I have no idea. I'm sure it's addressed somewhere in a book or online. I 
going to use this color combination to just build up my tonal values. And then I think I'm going to try to really spice it up with um, some friendly colors and make things happy near the end and cheerful. We recently watched a movie, um, if you're familiar with uh, Studio Ghibli, it's, I think it's Japanese. They did uh, Princess Mononoke, My Neighbor Totoro, um, Howl's Moving Castle, just like a whole bunch of um, Japanese animation films. And they're all up on HBO Max. We've been watching through those, and some of those I've had seen in the past, and one we saw recently, The Tale of Princess Kagume, I believe, or Kagune. I'm probably butchering that, and I apologize. It was just really fantastic um, artwork. The backgrounds were painted in such a beautiful, loose watercolor style with... Um, the characters superimposed, uh, drawn in the Chinese, uh, Japanese figure style. And uh, just visually, not even story-wise, just visually, it was just, it was, I was awestruck. It was just the whole time. It was just fantastic. Um, so I highly recommend watching that movie, especially, um, if you just want to see it just for the aesthetic value. Story-wise, I thought it was really interesting. I don't know. Some of it seemed a little bit dated. And if you watch it, you'll see what I mean. Um, or some of that stuff wouldn't fly <laughs> in the 2021. Uh, but I think, I think you'd enjoy it. We certainly did. We were definitely uh, in tears at certain parts. So I'm using a paper towel to kind of soften up this background to kind of give that fog effect that you'll see in the Chinese and Japanese um, landscape paintings. I am also hoping that I can get a textural effect to take place where if I go along this ridge line and lift up one above, it'll give kind of a far distant tree illusion. And that blocking off. Now this is pulling out the moisture of the paper as well. So that does affect the wet and wet stage. A lot of people in one of my videos have been asking, how do I keep things wet for so long? I need to um, do a video addressing that. But usually it's, you know, it's just from the, the pure saturation at the beginning and then using the Hake watery mix to build stuff up. And that keeps water there for me. Now, we are gonna do a dry off and then we'll put in some cheerful colors. So I'm gonna pause the camera and we'll dry. All right, so while I was using the blow dryer, I grabbed, grabbed a few tubes of paint just to talk real quick about that. Um, colors that remind me of the Oriental painting style. Uh, first of all, there's usually an opacity to the colored paint pigments of um, the Oriental style. There's a different binder in them I think it's animal glue, but ultimately they kind of have properties of uh, gouache. I grabbed cadmium orange U, which I really haven't played with that much, but the cadmium watercolors always feel a little bit more pegged to me. Uh, cerulean blue U, so it's not true cerulean, but um, it does have an opacity to me for some aspect. Uh, light red oxide. The lavender, which I think has white mixed into it, which you can do to get more of that opacity. I grabbed lemon yellow to mix with um, maybe a blue if I wanted to do a green. 
and I grabbed uh, Vermilion, which this isn't true Vermilion, but once again, it just pops up in those styles. I'm not sure if I'm going to use all or any of these, but I just wanted to um, talk about that for a moment before the next uh, stage. So I poured all those paints out. If we use them, I'll let you know. Uh, let's now move on to the next effect. I'm rinsing off the hate brush. And I'm going to look at kind of the top tree lines here. Um, I'm going to grab Ultramarine and Burnt Umber again. So I probably didn't need to rinse it, but I have it all splayed out. And we're now going to experiment with the far distant tops of the trees. And I think this is where I'll start introducing the interesting colors. letting paths of tree lines start to form. And they're not necessarily following the contours of these rolling hills. They start creating their own. And that's uh, you know, just creating interest in the Chinese painting, from what I remember, you can use a brush to do dots, or you could do even little uh, silhouettes of trees individually, or even mountaintop ranges. And like little houses on top of them and whatnot. Little stairwells and stuff. You can really kind of find a lot of fun stuff to explore within those paintings. Okay. Now, let's grab... A new color to play with. And I'm gravitating towards light red oxide. Why? I'm not sure. I'm going to try to get it where my hake is dry and splayed out like previously. We'll feed some of that in. When I mentioned a you know a smaller brush to put the dots in, I believe that'd be the more kind of meticulous method for mountains, and you'd put each individual in. But I'm using the hake to create that illusion and to kind of speed up the process. I'm creating different densities in different areas. Then from here, oh, by the way, people ask me what hake I use. I use the Ron Ranson hake. Um, it's a little bit like pre-worn, sharpened. I'm not quite sure how they do it, but I do have some um, cheap hakes that I'm going to do an experimental. I'm going to eventually, you know, experiment with to try to um, pre-wear or pre-war. I don't know the correct. Um, uh, <laughs> verbiage to use, I guess. Figure out how to, um, get a hake to this point very quickly. <laughs> okay, so this is the cadmium orange, the, uh, synthetic cadmium orange. We 
You can even grab some of the lemon yellow. And play with that. Okay. I'm going to switch up the pace a little bit. I'm going to go back to a dark. This is going to be my ultramarine again and my burnt umber. And I'm going to now put in uh, tree trunks. And I'm thinking Aesthetic wise, we can do kind of mid range trees here and then a taller tree here. Or we can do, yeah, we can do a full range. Let's see how it plays out. I'm just going for it. I'm kind of limited in the time of these videos. Not so much that I have something to do, but more so in that. Um, my camera stops filming after like 30 minutes whenever I do it directly to my phone. I may be going too high with these trees, but we'll see. And I'm just going to use the dotting effect to create this line of um, pine type trees. And I'm going quick with it. You could take it as slow as you want. Um, like I just said, you know, there is that kind of time constraint film wise. Exactly 30 minutes. If I can get my painting a little bit shorter than that, maybe 22 minutes. Maybe somebody could find me a Bob Ross type TV show to film. <laughs> so this is the number four rigger that I'm just using. I'm just dotting it in. Um, a lot of these techniques I learned through videos and whatnot from a Mr. Henry Lee, L-I. Uh, of Blue Heron Arts. He has a YouTube channel, um, Instagram presence. He has a lot of free videos and he also has um, exclusive videos on a uh, special website that he had. And I highly recommend checking him out. He also has a shop um, called Blue Heron Arts um, a website. And you can you know, purchase a lot of the Chinese painting materials from him. I'm taking the hay, uh, sorry, the number four rigger. I'm brushing sideways, a dry brush effect. This is kind of like the axe stroke that they use for rocks and whatnot to build up that. In fact, I'm gonna grab a lighter wash and try to do that so it sits behind these. Then I'm going to grab a darker wash, darker mix. And I'm going to put an outcropping right here. And I'll put a darker tree, a more detailed tree. This is where you can really just have fun. Let the brush make the calligraphy strokes. And you could come in and build a really cool old tree. Or you can take the hake, which I'll do.
put that in. And this is kind of like, I guess you would call it the bones of the painting. Um, what I'll wind up doing, I think, since we'll have time, I think we're at about 18 minutes in. I can um, then play around with a path and put people climbing up. This is uh, my dark mix again. I'm gonna grab the number one rigger, which is just good for small um, branches and twigs and whatnot. This will kind of be to add a little bit more oomph to these spots. But this is what I want to do. And now I want to play with little figures. make a path that goes through this mountain path. Put a little hut right here for them to stop at and rest. This is like, let's say a little scenic view right there. And along that path, maybe we have some trees this is what I was talking about earlier on ridge lines, little mountain trees. And all I'm doing is just vertical lines and little hash marks. And even though this is so far that you wouldn't see it in real life, It's, you know, to create that story of these things passing through and these people going on these paths. I could even demonstrate just the dots that we can use to create tree lines. Let's do another um, little path. We'll go back here. And then right back here, we'll have another stopping point. small hut on the side. Make a place where people could stay for quite a while. Okay. Grouping of trees here. Grouping of trees here. And you can see you could have left it as a foggy mountain or we could create this path. We could create small, far distant people walking up this path. And there's that ladder, the stairs. And with a probably a, th a way thinner brush and a lighter hand, you can really get a better effect, but them in. Let's do a copse of trees right here. Another stairwell. Another stopping point to rest. Because it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, right? And the cats are all about, I don't know what they're playing with. They keep on getting behind this one shelf of the items. 
And what are you all doing back there? thin paths. Put the trees up the top. Another group of trees at the top. I'm not even sure which cat is back there. Is that Hammy or Percy? I don't know. Well, you stopped when you heard your name, so I'm assuming it's Hammy. No, wait. <laughs> Let's do one final outpost at the top. And we can vary the size of these guys and the density of them. And that just adds more to the story. Let's see where we're at time-wise. Okay, I'm at 26 minutes. So, um, you kind of saw a little demonstration of that. I mean, of course, you can put more people in along these paths. And, um, a, like I said, a thinner brush would probably help achieve getting people with, like, backpacks and stuff like that. Or, you know, um, a walking stick, etc. And... We could throw some cerulean in there, the the synthetic, just to play around, just to add some splashes of color. How that affects the overall, I'm not quite sure yet, but. Just to build that tree up a little bit more. 